Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you alright? Yeah. You need to grab on the... I feel like this idea picked me. For whatever reason, I got the tap on the shoulder, and for better or for worse, I've spent a third of my life working on this. It's hard to say whether, you know, the culture existed at the time and I just helped promote it, or whether with the team of amazing people we've influenced a sense that there's a possibility here. I loved bikes. Riding growing up, I did little BMX rides. I went to mountain biking, road riding, triathlon. In high school, I had kind of been really excited about Bikes Not Bombs. It was this group that was shipping bikes to Nicaragua, and I just thought, how cool. And yet, I was too young, and they kind of didn't have the time of day for me. So I went off to college, and my freshman year, I did a research paper about how bicycles might be used to address poverty. The next year, my sophomore year, I managed to get into this class, manufacturing and design. I thought, well, it would be great to take used bike parts, see if we could turn them into bike trailers. In the end, it turned out it was like a beautiful product, but it was not at all related to the idea of recycled. But I was inspired. I said, hey, how can I continue this work with the research side of things? And so I got a grant from the Center for Latin American Studies. I went actually first to New York City and met with this guy, George Bliss. You see how the tubes literally are passing through each other. Oh, wow. <laughs> he was one of the first people to start making long johns in the United States with another guy named Jan Vandertine. I had to pick something to start with, so I picked the long haul. That design was what I considered probably the best inner city vehicle to move people or goods and kids. It was my first time really getting a chance to ride one of those Long John style bikes. I thought that was super cool and it just really was like, wow, I wonder if I can make these in Nicaragua and I kind of was in my mind going. That was possibly the best conversation I've ever had. Bliss is amazing, revolutionary. He stayed up till 3 a.m. talking to me about his ideas. He is my hero. His life is entrenched in his vision of the world with a bicycle. I want to build the slow cycle. It is amazing. Single track, large load, maneuverable, load visible. People in New York are so passionate about what they do. I pray they'll come to Nicaragua. I landed in Nicaragua, 19 years old. I walked into a cinder block workshop in the best armed neighborhood in all of Managua. It was one of the most intense and crazy times. It was like, you know, civil war, really hardcore crime. I mean, I was pretty freaked out. I lived there for six months with a group of war disabled veterans who I trained as bike mechanics and welders. Bikes Not Bombs is oriented around setting up small scale shops that use the, a container load of bikes that they ship down from Boston. They take those bikes out of the container, start fixing them up, sell them at a low cost. And in this shop's case, they wanted to have a cargo bike function. So it was kind of a cool pairing. The design methodology at Stanford was you go to where people are using something, watch them, understand their needs, attempt to make a prototype that would meet their needs, watch them break it, watch them use it, and evolve it. For the rural poor, a bicycle that's a pickup truck is a livelihood. And that's what I set out to do, to make a bicycle pickup truck. had to actually set up the shop and buy a welder and some tools and stuff. You know, we didn't have electric power, and so it was several months into my time there before we could actually get started. Together, we set out to make a bicycle that would work for the rural poor. My first design was a trailer. It turned out the only trails were basically single track, walking paths. And we found that it was too wide and difficult to make because we couldn't get the parts. And we tried the cargo trike, common in Managua, but really tippy and heavy and expensive. 
I was inspired by the Dutch style long john. When I first saw them in 1995, I realized the linkages are difficult. How are we going to do alignment? Man, there's no way. That's going to be way too complex. But I liked the idea of a long wheelbase bike, and I thought, what if we extended the back end instead? So I thought, well, let's see if we can do something around that. I read a couple of things, people messing around with that, and I'd seen a prototype or two. This guy, he called his bike the Ho Chi Minh bike. He showed how you could weld together two bikes and make like a long tail. His name is Ian Grayson in Australia. Fascinating character. And Ian sent me photos of long tails from the 70s. It was a affirming of the idea of extending something rearward. The Vietnamese built something similar to kick our butts, basically, in Vietnam. When I lived in Santa Cruz, I built a long tail, which is really quite cute because my girlfriend built a basket with a wicker in our bathtub. In New York, I used to deliver the newsletter for the advocacy group there, the Transportation Alternatives, by Longdale, and that was in the early 80s. I'm sure many people have made Longtail bikes in history. I mean, at the time of the turn of the century, the 1800s, the 1900s, I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds of fabricators that was like the gold rush. Everybody was making bikes. But in the early 1900s, motor vehicles very quickly became the thing. A new sound is heard across our country, and a new sight is seen. It is the automobile. And so we had this long period where bikes were all about racing. And only in a few places in the world, like Northern Europe, were people really evolving bikes for carrying cargo in a sort of a higher end way. And so trying to meet a need of somebody in the developing world ended up becoming a very cool design filter and a challenging approach. How can I do more with less? I love the idea of using existing bikes. When I came across the idea of a bolt-on kit, I realized any bike in the world would now be a potential cargo bike, and that would make it truly accessible. I was really interested in teaching people how to make this bike. In the course of traveling to Cuba, Senegal, South Africa, back to Central America, I was able to refine the design and evolve it into something that not only triples the cargo capacity of the bike, but it only adds 10 pounds and a foot in length. Bikes are converted to what are called extra cycles. The carriers are particularly important to women traders. Charging $80, just a bit more than they cost to build, allows the project to support itself. I met Ross in college. He was in product design which I thought was a stupid thing to be studying because I thought, well, the world doesn't need any more crap. At this point, I was traveling between the developed world and the developing world, and I was riding these prototypes, and it got exciting. I zoom back to the back and then come, then come back forward. I started using them to carry groceries and girlfriends and kayaks and crazy loads, anything that I could think of, you know, drill presses. When I took a few prototypes back home, people were really into it and psyched. It was like, all right, maybe there is more of a need here than I thought. It's a product. It's totally useful. And then I had my revelation. I thought, oh, OK, I guess there is a point to studying product design. I mean, I had ridden bikes my whole life, and I was riding them in a different way, in a way that fed my soul. And it was powerful. To be able to throw stuff on and be really independent like that on the bike, it's happened so many times, but it's still always exciting. 
We ended up wanting to turn people on to that experience. We believed that the U.S., that the world needed to have this experience that we were having. To feel like, wow, I've got all the stuff I need and I'm on my bike and I'm totally liberated. Go guys, go, 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 go! The concept of the long tail needed somebody to take a stand for it, and that's what set it apart. It's not like it was the first longer bike ever made, but it brought with it this passionate group of people and early riders that were seeking to change the world. When I'm gone now, bury me with my car. When I'm gone, bury me with my car. If anywhere is wherever I end up when I'm gone, I'm gonna need my ride, get around. So please, please, bury me with my car. Nice, Polly! a cowboy without his horse in America, in America, the barrier with our cars. Oh, yeah. Seventy-two Buick rolling by, hunker down Honda. Chewing up the roll, double decker Cadillac rolling up high, like a king on his throne. Last thing I wanna see before I die is a flash of 22 inch chromes in my eyes in America, in America. Come on, baby. started collaborating full force on Extra Cycle, developing two models, one for the developing world, which turned into the nonprofit World Bike. And then what was to become the Free Radical, the bolt-on kit, and the basic product of Extra Cycle. And I moved up into the foothills. I had a little shop outside my place. We made a hundred up there in, in Nevada County outsourcing all the tube bending. A friend was sewing all the bags. I trained people how to weld. You can't hire a, an experienced welder and pay them while we were having to make the product come out at a price. We quickly came out with a whole bunch of stickers that really defined our brand in a way made our first brochure, a spray paint stencil on the front, and it was real heavy duty and totally handmade and cool. I said, a new culture is coming. That was our idea the whole time, is that we could transform culture. And, you know, we had really grandiose ideas about how much of culture we could transform, like all of it. Sunday, November 19th, California. No sound wrong. Ross Chogi Extra Cycle Lab. Yesterday was a new start for us. We saw us like getting the new stars of the world. We saw us in Outside Magazine. And we were like number one things to buy for Christmas. And today is the first day where we are number one things to buy in California, in America, in North America, in the world, man. In the world! What else is going on over here? Are you making some food? I was, 
a kind of a outdoor enthusiast, a kayaker, and uh, always looked at options how to carry my kayak on the bike. <laughs> And then I met some friends kayaking. We were working in the bike industry, and then how that's how it started. I joined this um, this company called uh, Extra Cycle. I was starting at the time uh, with this extension kit. I was like, okay, well, that could be a good beginning to start. No, you should put a honk if you're a wuss on there, man. Don't put that one on. You know, we were like three guys doing a lot of things together from like adventures, going to shows and sleeping in the same houses. Kipchoge was kind of the creative mind. Ross kind of invented the concept. I literally helped um, start Extra Cycle, doing everything that is to do from setting up QuickBooks to going to bike show and visiting distributor in, you know, in Canada or in Europe. I put everything I had. I mean, uh, I breathe extra cycle. My family friend said, you gotta hear about this new bike. It carries anything you want and it still rides like a normal bike. Read about it online and wrote the equivalent of my senior paper on extra cycle. It was entitled, Is America Ready for the Extra Cycle? <laughs> by Paul Friedman. <laughs> Mike rides the way it did before, but now it can carry up to 200 pounds. What were your first impressions? What is that? All right, Caroline with her big load. Better. Very nice. How'd it feel? It's a little, it's a little wild. It's with the... the concept of this bike was so different, you know, because it was a bike that was trying to present a way to replace your car and carry things on your own, be free, and that that could somehow be a net positive, that the idea of making your life harder in this way, of carrying more, of having more of a burden, could somehow make your life better. Look at that. Is that permaculture or what? <laughs> That's going to be pretty permaculture too, huh? Fully lupular. <laughs> Lifter to injector pump. Yabba dabba do. Pretty much. What you doing? We're getting gassed up, man. What kind of gas you got? We got this conversion kit that makes it run on straight vegetable oil. All these people are super jazzed, idealistic warriors spreading the word about Extra Cycle, encountering realities of what it's like to sell a new product and a new concept and having the courage to be the first. When I look back at the first interbike I went to in 1997, you know, the big bike industry trade show, there was no such thing as utility bikes, cargo bikes, even baskets were like fringe, you know? Lance Armstrong was winning the tour for like the first or second time and he showed up with uh, the concept of bikes for transportation in America where people were laughing at us, you know. This is not where you want to sell your bikes, you have to go to China. It's not this kind of thing where some poor guy normally rides a hub and he comes into your shop and says, oh. I've been to Interbike maybe six or seven times and I always feel like I stick out. And we definitely did not make friends with the Interbike people. We were just always making our own rules and creating some kind of havoc. Just like clashing with the culture of Las Vegas in general, that never seemed like to me the appropriate place for Interbike. Certainly the antithesis of, a, of the new culture that we were imagining. It's for your mind.
Let's go for a ride. When I'm gone now, bury me with my car. When I'm gone, bury me with my car. Cause if anywhere is wherever I end up when I'm gone. 